Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Coaching. My name is Kevin Brits, Executive Coach, Trainer and uh, International Leadership Facilitator and host to the Lunchtime series where we add value to people's lives every day happening uh, on ebizradio.com uh, around 12 o'clock. Today we're going to be chatting to Managing Director at Athena Consulting. Um, he's the advisor at Center um, for International Business Development and the executive director at Global Chamber in Kenya. So welcome to our lunchtime chat today, Emmanuel Maingi. Is that correct, Emmanuel Maingi? Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot, Kevin, uh, for this opportunity. So as you've said, yeah, my name is Emmanuel Maingi, managing director for Athena Consulting. We are based out in Nairobi uh, and we've been in business for the last four years since April, uh, April May of 2016. Uh, my previous uh, experience, I used to work in international trade and advisory consulting under the then UK Trade and Investment, which now was actually absorbed by Department for International Trade. That is under the British government. So our main uh, focus as a company is we offer uh, three streams of services. And this is um, uh, the, 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 the first one is we do international trade advisory consulting. So basically foreign firms, they can be based whatever part of the world and they, they are looking for opportunities or they want to do business, for example, in Kenya or East Africa. Uh, so we are able to tailor make a specific market that is bespoke to them. So it can be market research, B2B, uh, seeking out opportunities, validating any opportunity or any contact or potential partner for any joint ventures. And our service offering is multi-sectoral. So we have, um, uh, before COVID-19, we were consolidated in an office. We were a team of six. But then again, when it happened, we closed the office. So people are working from home. And then uh, we also have a pool of other people who are on-call consultants for any specialized projects that we get. Uh, the second one is we do, it's in line with what you do, actually, you know, coaching. Uh, but for us, is a, it's not HR traditional HR, so we do what we call human capital development. Uh, and that entails, we do a lot of, uh, for example, for individuals who are stuck in their careers and they really don't understand, they want to find the path. It's more like, like coaching, but we start with that before we consider whether someone needs coaching. And uh, this includes, if, for example, if you're, let's say, entry level and above to C level, um, we, we, we take you through a psychometric assessment and the psychometric assessment we do is uh, based on Lumina Learning UK. I'm an accredited practitioner, so for Lumina Spark, psychometric assessment, and Lumina Sales. Then uh, on top of that, we also offer corporate training, and uh, this is specifically on two programs that we've developed in-house, but then they are backed by a scientific tool behind it. So one of them is called Mastering Emotional Intelligence, uh, which is now has the backbone of uh, Lumina Spark. And then we do um, Mastering the Art of Sales, Understanding the Sales Cycle again. And this is basically for business development professionals as well as sales teams within organizations. And then the third one is a very, should I say, it's a very close loop of, of, of a service because it's only specific. We only have one client we hope to grow, but uh, it's the Kenyan government. So we work closely with uh, security agencies. So we provide consultancy, systems design and integration, you know, for intelligence, uh, police, uh, military uh, applications. But also for, since we are not a manufacturer of original equipment, we also have uh, partners across the world who are able to provide with us uh, hardware where necessary as and when uh, you know that is required so yeah um, in a short or medium brief yes, <laughs> that's, that's us yeah no, that's that's a, it's a thorough brief <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> so Emmanuel, you know when we first uh, connected online um, you obviously saw the the lunchtime series online and uh, we connected on LinkedIn but you yeah. know uh, you know from what I read about you um and uh, you know you speak into to it like this um there's a lot of experience that comes with this and um yeah. uh, you know for me it's a case of going well let's have really good conversations with people who who yeah. really can make a difference in the world today um so that's yeah. inevitably what i'm always aiming to do so don't you want to tell us because it's quite interesting i'm i'm quite keen on hearing what it is uh that we are talking about today i know that um 
uh, you send me some information, but I, I want, I'd like you, if you could preface that yeah. information for us and share an o oversight and overview of what it is we're going to be chatting to. Yeah, so ideally, I'll be talking about, you know, effective leadership in agile organizations and how, you know, effective, why is it important actually to embed uh, leadership styles, uh, you know, which forms part of the organizational culture. You know, those are the two key uh, things that I'll be addressing today. And in terms of when you say just for, just for uh, viewers listening and uh, anyone watching the the sort of takeaway from today, yep. agile organization that specifically refers to what? Uh, these are organizations that have they have grown over time and based on their experience they have a vision and they know where they want to go, but then uh, you know that has to be driven driven from the top. So it depends on whether the leader sits at the top or his leadership style is he sits at the bottom of the pyramid where he interacts with you know the rest of the staff to be able now to actually drive the vision and the growth strategy of that organization fantastic so in terms of uh what that is what does effective leadership uh, entail in an uh, an agile organization so um you know, for me, I'll address, um, you know, looking at uh, coming from a point of the seven leadership styles and every organization, uh, it depends on the type of business that that company or leader is in. And, uh, you know, it can be public sector, it can be in private sector. And the difference between the two is if, for example, you're the commanding officer for a security force, uh, that is a very authoritative institution and there's normally a chain of command. So, you know, when the order comes, through you do as you're told questions later when you're doing uh you know a debrief of what went wrong or what we could actually improve but this this uh i'll mention um you know in brief the seven styles and then now i'll come into you know what shapes the organizational culture which are the yes. three fundamental um reactive to creative uh, to uh, creative mindset uh, shifts yeah uh, and this is uh, i'll start with you know the autocratic style which is you know do as i say and uh, my way is the way and um that in itself doesn't really sit well and i think this in the modern world that we are living in today you find that uh, you know they say the millennial worker and that kind of person is they really don't care whether how much you're paying them so long as for them they are looking to be able to grow their career in a stable environment where people now are talking about mental health health issues is it the workplace that actually contributes to their mental uh, health issues or yeah. does the organization have a system basically to help them grow and if you're in an authoritative or, or autocratic style of an, uh, an organization then there is pretty much uh, nothing that can be done basically to give uh, the morale of the company for someone, for example, to be there within five years, unless there is a case of desperation. And that Absolutely, is not yes. one. So if we could quickly run through just that the one to seven and then let's maybe, you know, yes. speak to them like yeah. that. What is the second one? Yeah. The second one is the authoritative style, uh, which is basically uh, visionary. Uh, follow me, you know, that kind of uh, style. Then you have, of course, pace setting, do as I do. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's a perfect, uh, it's perhaps one of the ultimate uh, leadership styles required in leading and retaining uh, today's top talent, what I've just mentioned about, you know, the millennial worker. And then uh, the fourth one, of course, you have the democratic style, which is very consultative. Do um, What do you think about uh, the decisions I'm making within the team or within the organizations? Does it align with your KPIs or objectives? Yeah. Then there's the coaching style, which uh, you and I are more aligned to, where we, you know, uh, we look at considering, you know, consider this approach. This is where you are and this is what we want to achieve. So how yeah. can we actually work together to achieve this? And then you have the affiliative style, which is, you know, people coming fast. And I believe when you talk about agile organizations is they are people oriented uh, against systems. We talk about a lot of artificial intelligence replacing some, you know, some roles. But then uh, at the end of the day, it's the people within that organization that determine its success or yeah. failure. And then um, number seven? 
uh, laser fair, you know, which is very, you know, laid back. There's very little oversight. And, you know, whoever is working within those teams, you know, they do as expected, but then there's not so much follow up or um, micromanagement per se. And, you know, you do as you feel. So long as you meet your objectives, I really don't care how you do it. Fantastic. So in terms of just running through them, what specifically they do? I mean, autocratic, we started with that one. So, you know, I find that um, people who tend to follow this leadership style, um, I always, as much as um, it may work for some people, um, I do find that it's uh, it definitely challenges people in a way that not, doesn't necessarily drive them uh, and and so support how, how you want to drive vision in your world. But um, autocratic is definitely a style <laughs> that I, I think a yeah. lot of people still adapt and uh, adopt and use in their, their organizations. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so should I begin with the laser fair? It's, it's, it's true. It's because you see the thing is laser fair. Yeah, it can work for some organizations, but then it depends on how leadership drives the culture. And a lot of the time you find if you set people free, they become loose cannons uh, because, you know, there's no there's not so much accountability and responsibility at the end of the day. So you find a lot of these people who work under such structures. There are some who perform well and others become, you know, winning by all costs. They cut corners because at the end of the day, you are the sitting at the helm for you is driving strategy and vision. And your expectation is, um, you know, they'll do what is right, but we are human. You know, and uh, if your focus is only on the balance sheet, then that's what you get. But then you don't form a futuristic leaders because if some that person leaves that organization and if it was toxic uh, on how they deliver, then whatever they go, they are going to take that with them. And it's it's you know as a, uh, I was watching one of the um, speeches, uh, commencement speeches by Denzel Washington. I think it was in Princeton and he said, you know, you are what you practice. You practice something for far too long, you become a pro at it. So when they leave, that's what they take out there. And and you suppose that uh, <laughs> knowing that that you know the balance sheet is 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 nice, yeah. um, but when you do take that approach in laser fair, the laser fair approach, um, what is your recommendation in terms of um, why that doesn't work? It's it's it comes down to what I mentioned earlier on on accountability and responsibility because at the end of the day I, it, it has there are two two should I say institutions or forms of institutions where it can work or it cannot work so if you look for example in entrepreneurship and you're a solopreneur or you you have a startup that you're coming up with. Uh, this is this is the kind of actually uh, style to use because at that point in time, if you're a tech startup, you're looking for uh, let's say a CTO who's experienced in that field who will be able to develop, you know, drive product development. You need uh, a good CMO, someone who understands, you know, the world of marketing and in tech. Um, but then again, you know, it's very important because if you do not set the pace from the beginning, because a lot of the assumptions are, and I've experienced that. My personally, when I started out, I I had uh, a partner who you know I thought would drive, um, you know, uh, business development because that's he's good at that, and I knew him. I worked with him for over six years. But then uh, what I didn't realize was I, I was too laid back in the, you know, what we needed to do. Yes, I would laid the milestones, what we needed to achieve and within what specific period of time. Uh, but then we had a falling out, you know, within the first six months because I realized uh, they did not understand that there needed to be a structure. So for them, they would work wherever they want, whenever they want. And, you know, when you ask them, they tell you, you know, I'm also a partner. And you see, that's the kind, that's the wrong kind of approach to take. And especially when you're scaling up a business. Yeah. So I think in terms of just hearing from what you're saying, in terms of trusting people, kind of you, you kind of yeah. make it, you automatically go, well, I do know you. Obviously, yeah. this is going to work. Uh, so your approach is slightly different in your leadership style. But uh, six months down the line, you're going, oh, dear, <laughs> this is not yeah. working, right? <laughs> yeah. Everything so, went belly up. And, and, and I use... Uh, my kind of lead 
leadership is lays affair with a lot of uh democratic kind of leadership for me i uh, even if i know you even if you family member and i'm i want to uh for example they we we are trying to invest in a different model of um you know fast food business uh we're still in the uh, in the works to develop the strategy and you see i'm pulling a you know a family member but even so i've i've from the lessons that i've drawn previously is i have to interview them yes i know them they are family but then again there's that kind of familiarity that you know breeds contempt over time because someone feels you have power over them and you have no right to tell them what to do but then again this is a professional engagement so yeah. i need to know that i can trust you and i need to know what your capabilities are because many people go out there and say oh i'm very connected i'm very well networked and i ask you prove it to me i i'll throw it to you it's an interview it will carry take you one week introduce me to this person and this person yeah prove to me yeah. that you can do it Absolutely. and when you do that i'm confident but then on top of that now i have to say now it's up to you i want you to come up with your uh uh kpis and objectives what do you think your role is going to look like yes i already have that in writing but then i also want to see what they think and whether they understand what the whole strategy is and then now when we have a sit down we are able now to match the two we eliminate some from my side and also from their side to be able to have that perfect uh, synchronicity of what you want to achieve and i yeah, think that yeah. is that is one of the uh, big guest uh oversights that many people across you know the leadership board uh um, so and you know in, don't see in terms of what you're saying now that's that that is more your kind of de de democratic kind of uh style right yes absolutely yeah because so, I'm, because after that now i let you run and i'll i'll even ask you i'll send you my calendar just like when you when we were organizing for this uh for this uh session for this chat yeah. you know you shared your calendar so it was for me to choose the dates that are open and timing you know so i have to plan myself so i tell them yes this is my calendar but i want you to plan our weekly and monthly charts i want you to choose them at an appropriate time that is suitable to you so some, to some extent yeah. i am laid back i don't want to impose myself on them yeah because everyone has a different you know way of working so speak to us about um affiliate style um how do we use an affiliate style of leadership and and where does that stand out for us in in a in a in a in a business um it's it's um I'll give you an example of what I talked about, you know, people talking about artificial intelligence. It's a big part of our lives nowadays. Uh, and I'll give you an example of, um, so we are doing, um, we're in discussions. Basically, we we want to expand our, um, our um, service portfolio. I should have mentioned that in the beginning when I was introducing myself, but yeah, yeah here I am. So uh, basically, so what you're doing is we, we, we are cutting the agency. Because a lot of the time you find in marketing, you're a corporate a corporation and you have a marketing budget and strategy, but then you need to hire an agency, marketing agency, to be able to drive that strategy, client onboarding, engagement with the public and see how they can convert that into money. But now uh, a, a partner, which we are going now into an affiliate program with them is we are looking at, okay, why is it that uh, a lot of the companies that engage these agencies do not get the real value on money you know they spend a lot of money billions of dollars every year so why why don't we go to the client to the small four-man team uh, who are offering let's say massage services or parlor a beauty parlor someone who's offering fast food uh, um, running a fast food business but they are yeah. put strapped when yeah. it comes to their budget so we come to you and tell you don't pay us now let us convert the sales for you. You pay us per sale made. Mm -hmm. So it's an AI system. So using that example is it cannot run on its own, even though it's an AI. So we have we we are now in discussions of how to put together a sales and marketing team that will be able to go and speak to the real people who are the owners and managers of these businesses so at the end of the day the business is all about people we can put systems and this is affecting for example here in kenya i'll give you an example the banking sector so back in two th early 2000s we had vodafone come into the market uh, through a joint venture with the kenyan government where they set up safaricom Safaricom is the pioneer and innovator behind M-Pesa, you know, the mobile uh, money wallet payment 
yeah. system. Now, through the sector, because banks were caught, uh, you know, flat footed, they didn't know how to react to that. They were used to the traditional model of, ah, it's we are people oriented, so we'll always have that teller, that kind of person. So, so here, Emmanuel, they had, sorry, just say that again. Um, the signal sort of cut you there. So, you're saying banks, and uh, just start from where you spoke about the banks, yes, yeah? banks. Yeah, so at that time when Safaricom launched, they went from a hundred customers to hundreds of thousands of customers within three years to uh, wow. now they are at about uh, 23 million customers. Wow. In this country, <laughs> if, yeah, if you own a cell phone, even the, I'll give you an example, even the 90 year old granny in the village and they have a phone, that's the only way that they're able to transact with people who are working in urban areas if they are family. Yeah. So it become even a payment system. Everyone now we don't carry a lot of cash, you know, liquid cash on us. So banks didn't know how to react to that. So what they did is they came to the party too late, they ran into the whole um, uh, approach and adopted a system driven um you know kind of an organizational model yeah now what happened with that is um they lost a lot of clients because people realize why is it that i should bank with you and you've introduced mobile banking now you're charging me to actually use the mobile banking application you're charging me to use uh online banking so um <laughs> yes. all i just need to do is so that safaricom saw it and picked then after it so they introduced a uh, standard development kit and sdk which would plug into the banking platform so nowadays i don't need to go to the bank, uh, pull money from my bank into my wallet and withdraw it yeah uh i can you know so even atms they're out of business so in a sense what happened is these banks now cut back on customer service customer care you know personnel because they assume systems driven kind of uh customer experience were going to make the change so that is now they've started realizing that but i think it's too late but then again you know it's never too late to start so they need to start thinking about their own people the customer service departments are the core of the business and this model works very well with uh, the safaricom company that i've just mentioned their customer care is i'd say hands down is second to none in this country you know as in their chop chop you know you 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 have a problem you can tweet them you can text they are free ussd codes that you can actually uh interact with them and you know immediately if they need to call you they'll call you Absolutely. so within a minute of your issue because again you're dealing with people here yeah. and if i experience something uh with your if your system is too automated then i i am sorry you know we live in a in a democracy and uh um a capitalistic world i'll take my business where i'm appreciated absolutely yeah. in terms of the coaching styles speak to us more about the coaching styles i know that you know as you mentioned we're both in uh, in the business of coaching um how is this a, in a, as a leadership style why is this important and how when is it effective really it's it's important in terms of uh, i'll give you an example of my previous experience you know within uk trade and investment and that's where i picked a lot of the lessons well i continue to refine them over time but what happened is um when you use the coaching style of leadership uh, you empower people to trust you first of all that you have their best interest at heart and you show them the way unlike whereby you know you want to impose yourself on the boss and what i say is what goes so a lot of the people if they are interested in moving up the organization they don't feel empowered enough to be able to take that leap they might have actually a better offering in terms of their skill set but then they fear approaching leadership because leadership is too uptight and you know they cannot be questioned yeah so um from from my perspective i believe if you're a leader whatever field you're in whether you're in the military or not you know it's very important to empower the people who are working around you whether it's the assistant whether it's the person at the front desk show them that look their contribution matters but again i don't want you to be in this role within the next year mm -hmm. i want you to work with me i will come to you and ask you that look 
what is it that you where do you want to be in the next five years and i know a lot of these questions you ask someone and they're like hey, I, well the standard is i want a better pay i want to make work for a better organization and i ask them don't you think this organization actually fits within that criteria you want to earn more money you want to have advanced your career so why don't you go back so i go back to my democratic style and tell them look i want you to come up with um come up with your steps what you want to do in the next six months yeah. for you to learn what the let's say the business development team is doing because you can be at front desk and you you majored in let's say sales and marketing but then yeah you needed to pay your bills so after that then i'd recommend that you pay yourself through shadowing like a few hours or you know on the and on afternoon on friday when there's not too much activity before we close business you talk with that person you get to observe what they do you start learning from there because again that person can be let's say you're going on maternity uh, cover who will i bring in if you actually express interest in that and you're willing to work with me so i think a lot of the time organization are too or leaders are too busy uh making the money pushing the balance sheet interacting basically with business leaders out there but then we don't see that there are people in our system that need that constant growth and to be honest all of us started somewhere all of us were mentored by someone so i'd say it's a mentorship style you know coaching mentorship Absolutely. style you mentor someone to be much better and if you can be a better you know leader than me maybe in the future my organization grows and i i want to take an early retirement and you're good at what you do and i know i think you basically to end the organization. yeah and in terms of pace setting tell us more about pace setting and where, where do where do you find leaders using pace setting um a, a number of organizations so for example right now uh of course before covid 19 because many companies cut back on their operational budgets marketing and that kind of thing but before that we saw or the few ones that we had started speaking to about trying to think how they can actually they change the model of uh, having to retain and uh, uh to capture you know um what do you call it um uh hire attract hire and retain that top talent and this is where it comes with people observe you as a leader what you do within the organization and if you're this kind of a person who who believes in uh what is written on the book is written on a rock and nothing cannot change so for example uh as a leader if you're you know it depends on the scale of the organization it works differently uh, but then if you're let's say in a blue chip company then there's a reason why you have let's say a board of directors you have an advisory board you have um uh, you know team leaders divisional leaders those are the people heading those units and you should be able to consult them and ask them why is it like for example we are having you know we are seeing a lot of uh, turnover employee turnover and they will be they can tell you that uh, maybe it's the pay a lot of them really don't give us feedback and that's when now you need to sit down with these people if it's the hr department you ask them look i need us to come up with a strategy and a strategy to better understand our employees a feedback system which can be my recommendation would be set up a system that is um, uh, anonymous because other people in as much as you might be having that open door policy not everyone is very um approachable or they they think you're approachable so yeah. a lot of the time it's about having that chat what are the systems we are using and how are they limiting you know uh growth of our employees but then again are we attracting the you know the right kind of people and if the answer is no then that strategy needs to be developed it's because right now if you don't use that and, and i'm saying all these styles have an application within an organization i'm not saying there's a perfect one each of them is applicable at every stage of leadership sometimes you have to be authoritative because you know sometimes you as a leader you have to make um, an, an infamous and an uh, favorable decision you know for the better of the company and basically also to protect the credibility as well as the, the other people working within the organization so 
So you can, once you have that conversation with your team leaders, then you come up with a strategy and decide, okay, fine. Um, let's start having an, a conversation around, um, let's say nowadays is a big thing. We saw the Me Too movement, and it's because a lot of these uh, Hollywood Western companies never factored in um, policies, developing policies around bullying, harassment, and discrimination. A lot yeah. of organizations don't have this. And, um, you know, I, I'd say that's a good start, you know, for someone to say that, look, we um, we believe in gender equality. So we'll start, uh, first of all, looking at the payroll. You know, uh, we don't want to pay people within the same band different salaries. If it's a woman, she's clocking in some number of hours, so she needs equal pay. Yeah. Um, so you come up with these surveys. You can use Survey Monkey, whatever. You come up with the statistics. You sit down as a team, discuss that, break it down. People observe what you're doing. So if you don't lead from the front and the back, uh, as well as in the middle, then a, a lot of the times people will not be proactive with whatever changes you make. And a lot of the time, that's when you find uh, staff or other employees saying that, look, it's not my company. So for me, I will only do the bare minimum and bounce. Whatever happens, I really don't care. And then they are out there looking for other job opportunities. So they don't give you the 100% of what you should achieve. Absolutely. So, I mean, we have covered all seven of them. I'm just making notes here. Yeah. We've covered all seven of them in your conversations now. Um, if you could, uh, because lunchtime, I wish lunchtime leadership uh, or lunchtime coaching at least has, a, a, you know, we have, <laughs> we're speaking about leadership, but we, we, we have more time to be able to investigate a little bit further. But if you had to leave uh, sort of some advice to, to uh, any, any business leaders out there and kind of go, you know, understand this and understand why this is important. Because as you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier now, that there isn't a perfect fit for everyone, you know, but the knowledge of what it is, how it does help, um, and how it serves you with your environment, I think that's sort of paramount. I just want to leave some uh, three three key takeaway moments from why it's important for us to to understand what our leadership styles are and when to use them and when not to use them. Um, yeah, so um, for me, I'd say I'd, I'd even touch on, you know, the... Um, what how some of these styles shape the organizational culture and there are three points to that it's a first of all everything has to be based on experience your experience but also if you're coming in as a new leader within that organization uh take time to before you you start you know driving your strategy try to understand what has been the experience how was the previous leader uh, what was it that they wanted to achieve? Has it been achieved? If not, what is it that you can do to change that? Then now you try and evaluate yourself based on your style and what you want to achieve into the future. And you actually set milestones, you know, measurable milestones. And these can be, you know, from the... Uh, um, short-term to medium and long-term. And short-term, I mean... Start working on blocks of, let's say, the first six months. The first six months is you need to understand the organization. And then uh, within that, of course, you'll be working with other members of the team. After that, what is the next step? Let's say between the sixth month and the next two and a half years, which forms three years, you know, medium term. And then long term, you look into five years. What do you want to achieve? Do you want to change, um, you know, how uh, communication basically is handled within the organization? So one, it has to come from from a certain, um, you know, from certainty to discovery, because everyone assumes, yes, you're taking up this role. So, you know, everything is going to be um, perfect. And you, on this point, you have to foster innovation, you know, Absolutely. playing to win and being in control based on those experiences. Then now you also have, based on what I mentioned earlier on an experience, you also have to come from authority to partnership. You know, uh, you need to foster collaboration because a lot of the time, and I've seen this mistake, a lot of the time you find like the CEO or the managing director or divisional director is the person who gets, uh, you know, all the congratulation messages, you know, gets the paid holidays by the board of directors because, hey, you hit our targets and surpass them. But do they ever ask themselves how the people, the boots on the ground actually did to be able to achieve that, you know? 
you know you cannot be siloed in hierarchy and assume that you know um uh, you know you'll only work on a uh, reactive mindset and everything is going to work at some point people will be like um, i i'll call in sick and that person might be who's leading that initiative so what happens in such a case so you start missing deadlines um um sometimes you just need in terms of that to actually achieve that if it's a let's say an award gala pick pick one of the middle management employees and tell them you know what go represent me i will be seated at the audience but i want you to take charge mm. you empower them people start seeing that you appreciate them and they bring they will come to you with ideas it's so interesting that you say that i um i i, I listen to keith verazzi um he's an international speaker he often speaks around collaboration um and one of the significant points or mistakes that he says that most organizations do is we we have a good idea we create a business we collaborate in such a big way and there's a lot of collaboration happening and then the next step because we're having success with our business somehow we kind of go oh we're just going to employ an hr person and the hr person is going to handle everything and it's the quickest way to debilitate the collaboration because suddenly people are going no we function really well with being in a collaborative space we function really well with um having my own time as my own um and sort of working where i want to work and and i think a lot of people now in the world specifically being virtual and doing virtual stuff um i think a lot of people have to start considering or considering the the the, the impact that collaborating will have in their teams um, and, and how they used to measure the, their performance has to change because um, if we don't take a different sort of inroad with how my leadership has been shown up in, in my work environment, um, I might be debilitating my own team because I don't foster enough collaboration. So I, I absolutely love that you, that you say that. And it's uh, just to add on that, it's very, you've mentioned a very critical point because everyone thinks HR people are people oriented and when they come in, they solve all the problems. <laughs> yes. And like you say, you know, it's a shift of the same problem. You know, it's the entry, I don't want to walk, here it is. And, and, and I'll give you an example of uh, on the psychometric front, we did a psychometric uh, assessment, you know, when you are doing the course on mastering emotional intelligence for a legal firm. And the observation was very quite interesting. So we started with the HR team. They have a big team. It's an Africa-wide um, 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 network yes. of uh, legal professionals and you know partner firms. And you know when we generated because now when we do the assessment, we normally generate about forty-one pages of individual reports. So it's quite in depth, and you know getting to look at the personalities and how they conflict with people. And a lot of those people, uh, they came out, they are in HR, they should have been empowering green kind of people yeah. and inspiring yeah. yellow, but they were the opposite. They were actually commanding red. And when we had the conversation, it came down to one thing. It, they use a lot of authority. So whereby mm -hmm. organizations, the HR has the power to hire and fire, which should not be the case, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's a case of, you know um you know it's an out of world this case you know and <laughs> it, it was very interesting and when we ask now because we went and carried a survey now based on the people who doesn't do, do not work with the, within the hr department and they say yeah we we can't communicate with the hr because they are too rigid and you know we just do as they say so yeah. if it's an indiscipline case, I take it to them. So you ask them, so how do you solve indiscipline cases in the organization? And they tell me, yeah, we, we look at the evidence that is being submitted by the complainant and, you know, the person who's, uh, you know, who's, um, you know, who's done that. Then we have a chat with them and we conclude and fire them if they need to be fired <laughs> or we issue a notice of a, you know, a warning letter. They yeah. tell them that's wrong because the thing is, do you do your independent investigations? Do you, mm. you need to start looking at forming an independent unit outside the HR, which gives you oversight. You need oversight. The CEO and the other directors do not have that time. So that oversight committee should be 
uh, we used to in my previous organization we used to have what was called the first response uh, first response uh, officers and those officers were in charge of they were people it's a volunteer on a volunteer basis but then they were the first point of contact in times of conflict when two people within the organization feel they've been discriminated and this touches on what i talked earlier about bullying yeah. harassment and yeah. discrimination yeah so by the time now you go to hr there is a case and a step by step whereby it's like the cost legal system where justice systems work no matter what you've been accused of until you're proven guilty you're innocent yeah yeah you absolutely know? Yeah. So in terms of uh, our last takeaways, uh, you mentioned going from certain yes. certainty discovery, uh, foster collaboration, and and what is that third one that you can leave us with uh, today? The, yeah, the third one is moving from scar uh, scarcity to abundance, which is, uh, you know, fostering value creation. And yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you, as a leader, you have to look at to work from a point of limited opportunities in the world. They say, you know, as the saying goes, you know, the sky is too broad or big for every bird to fly. But yes, it is every bird that has wings that can fly. So exactly. how how do you how do you move from that mindset of every bird can fly? Not every bird can fly. So you as a leader have to see yourself from a point of limitation. What is it? How limited are you? And if you actually don't know where to start with, look for a coach. I'm a coach. You're a coach. You know, we can start from a psychometric assessment. I get to look at your three personalities, how they affect your individual life, your work life, and, you know, how do you react to your employees, especially when you're stressed? Because you're this, you need to see yourself as a city nut and then build yourself with the people that you create this opportunity you empower the teams and tell them look i want you to go out there make this some company grow embrace them show them the ways to go about it. introduce them to your networks and through that you get to grow and then you will morph from that uh, what's it called um it's like a butterfly you know the yes. process it goes through and eventually you hatch and you actually fly and the sky will be the limit for you so yeah <laughs> fantastic so just want to wrap that up from from certainty to discovery foster collaboration and get, get go from scarcity to abundance and that's the wonderful takeaways that we've got from yeah. uh, emmanuel maingi um, emmanuel so if we want to get hold of you like um what is your website where do we go what's the easiest way for us to check out who it is, what you guys yeah. do, and, and more information. Yeah, so our website, um, we have two, okay, we have a live website, um, and we are developing a more interactive, you know, one, so that is in the works. But yeah. the live yeah. website is www.athenaconsulting.co.ke. That's athenaconsulting.co.ke. Uh, you can, you know, people can reach me on my email, which is emaingi, that's E-M-A-I-N-G-I at athenaconsulting.co.ke. And uh, our phone numbers, the official number is plus 254-743-368853. And my personal mobile phone is plus 254-737-000593. And that is on WhatsApp. Both lines actually can be reachable on WhatsApp. Fantastic. So all this information will be shared in the actual description box below in the video, guys. So please join us again. This has been Lunchtime Coaching. goes out live on ebizradio.com every day at 12 o'clock. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing the wisdom. Uh, the pleasure is mine. And thank you and stay safe in given uh, the circumstances at this point in time. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a great day. All right. Cheers. Bye. Ciao, ciao. ciao.